Dr. Sibba Chopra from Ludhiana. He is the professor of cardiology, Dayanan Medical College, Ludhiana. Dr. S and she is the leader of Women Association of Cardiology in India. Dr. Chopra, please. Yeah, thank you so much for a very kind introduction, uh, sir. And thanks for having me here. I'll be talking about ACS interventions in the very young, a topic which is very dear to my heart. I talk of the patients uh, whom we have collected over an era and who are less than 30 years of age. So just going through the gamut of uh, cases, uh, this patient presented 28 years old male, presented with acute coronary syndrome, troponins were positive. We can appreciate the borderline lesion which was there in the LED was given intensive pharmacological management and this is what his lesion was. This patient was uh, uh, kept on medical therapy and uh, this is the second case, 29 years old male, presents with inferior volemi, was thrombolized with uh, tenecta place, had significant tight lesions uh, in LAD and in LCX. Thrombotic lesions, we can appreciate the ectasia and the slow flow in the arteries. The patient underwent stenting to LAD and LCX. Case 3, 30 years old male presents with acute coronary syndrome, positive troponins, osteoproximal lesion in the LAD, again thrombotic and a drug eluting stent deployed in LAD. Case 4, 28 years old male presents with acute inferior wall MI, significant LV dysfunction and we can appreciate good amount of thrombus which was there in the proximal RCA. This patient underwent stenting to RCA. Case 5. This patient was a 26 years old male. He was not a smoker. He presents with acute anterior wall MI, was taken up for a primary PCI. We can appreciate immense thrombus, which is there in the left anterior descending artery. He receives periprocedural abscissimab. Aspiration is done for the thrombus. A drug eluting stent, zotarolimus eluting, is deployed. Also receives a post stent dilatation with a 415 balloon. Was doing pretty fine. Planned for a discharge. Day 5 of the patient in ICU and he suddenly collapses. He collapses, we do an echo and the echo reveals a dilated right atrium, right ventricle, tricuspid regurgitation, or we free what aconitic sign present and we think of pulmonary embolism, patient is rushed back into the cath lab and to our horror, he has got significant pulmonary embolism. Before we plan for further suction, the patient had already been thrombolized a couple of days back. Before we plan for suction and acting on, we thought, why not have a look at the coronary status? And to our horror, this 26 years old gentleman who has undergone a primary PTCA and got sick has got an acute stent thrombosis just proximally. This patient was taken, the wires were put, the stents were deployed. We had to deploy two stents in the LAD. The patient remained very sick and had to be taken up on ECMO support. However, he succumbed and we lost this 26 years old male who undergoes a primary PCI for anterior wall MR. Moving on with stories, case six, this is a 25 years old male a smoker presents with anti wall MI. We can see a lesion in proximal LED was taken up for stenting. However, to our horror, we see a good amount of thrombus in LED. He receives intracoronary tenecta place. And 24 hours later, we decided not to stent because of this degree of thrombus. And 24 hours later, this is what the check angio reveals. The LED was fully flowing and this patient goes home pretty fine without any stent and just on antiplatelets and medical therapy. Case 7, again, uh, again, a 26 years old male presents with anterior wall MI, had a VT, had to be cardioverted. It was a critical elevation, but with lessons learned from the past, he receives intensive pharmacological management and a check angio was done after a week, thinking of stenting this LED lesion, but we found an LED which was flowing with hardly any significant disease in LED and was sent home on medical therapy. Case 8. 24 years old male this time, even less than 25 years, a diabetic. He was a karaoke singer at a restaurant. The night before he came to us, he had taken Red Bull, Red Bull with some flavored hookah. It's a trend to take flavored hookahs in the bars nowadays. And he came to us with anti wall MI. He had a distal lesion in LAD, 100% occluded, was kept on medical therapy, but had severe LV dysfunction. Case 9, this time a 22 years old male. 
He had just taken some energy drink with decode target because he had URI, presented to us with ECG changes and positive troponins, and the angiogram was essentially normal with some slow flow, which was there in the RCA, kept on medical therapy. Case 10. A 26 years old male presents with STT changes in inferior wall. This was a restauranter and uh, he had come to get some restaurants in Punjab and had taken some energy drink with his friends and uh, with very atypical pain but significant troponins. And angiogram was essentially normal but with some slow flow in the coronary arteries. Case 11, a 28 years old male presents with anterior wall MI was thrombolized with streptokinase elsewhere and was referred to us for an angiogram. By the time we took him up for a check shot, we can see that the coronaries were pretty well open and recanalized. He was left on medical therapy. He had been taking some anabolic mask in as of whey protein and supplements before coming to us. And this is what the, he showed us. And this was case 12. This time, a 20 years old male having history of multi-substance abuse came with acute inferior wall MI. And we found this flow in his right coronary artery slow flow. He had been taking some protein powders in the gym. Case 13. This time it was terrible. It was even less than 20 years. He was a 19 years old male. It presented with chest pain. We all thought that it was not coronary, but admitted him. But proponents came out to be positive with significant STP changes. Due to dearth of time, I cannot be showing those ECGs. This guy, 19 years old, male, a school going student, had history of taking hash puffs and smoking with his friends before coming to us. Luckily, the angiograms were normal, maybe with some recatalyzed and a plaque, which we could see in LAD. Case 14, in this COVID season, this was June this year. This guy comes 27 years old male with anterior wall MI had to be thrombolized. He had history of significant alcohol binge and this is what his coronaries were. There was slow flow in the coronaries and slight ectasia and some plaque in the mid LED around the region of septal. He had his hematocrits which were pretty high thought of polycythemia. Ultimately he underwent a bone marrow which proved to be normocellular and uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, after three weeks of having this MI when he came for follow-up he had fever oh, and please, uh, was evaluated for COVID. Please, please. Yeah so I'm done with my cases but would like Yes, see through. that ACS is a rare entity. They have an increased thrombotic value. Uh, pardon, sir? Yeah. So yes, they, have, they have an increased thrombotic value. Probably they need a different management strategy or deferred intervention versus an aggressive immediate intervention or an intensive pharmacological uh, uh, treatment. This is a point to ponder. We have been finding a rise in the incidence of cases of ACS and even new thing which we have been added to our data is the amount of drug abusers which we have been able to appreciate in this very very young population in fact we have more recap analyzed arteries in them and there are rising trends of drug abuse which we have been able to appreciate over the last three years probably because now the data is prospective rather than just a retrospective data these are the patterns of drug abuse which we have realized opium very significant in north india besides energy drinks protein, supplements, marijuana, heroin, spasm, proxy one. So to conclude, we need a prospective multicentric study. We need to identify newer risk factors. I'm always asked about the genetic markers, the lipoproteins, the FOB levels. Yes, we need to interrogate them, but because they drop once in a while, these cases to actually have a series is a tough job. We need better imaging modalities. We need OCTs. We need IVAs to study these arteries. They are very different with a different robotic milieu. And a newer upcoming thing is probably drug abuse because that is the trend of society. There is a trend to denial of drug intake by these very young children and their parents. But there are rising trends when we study and we need to do something to prevent this. Thank you so much uh, for a patient hearing. Thank you for the presentation. Coronary disease is in young. Thank you. Next speaker, that is the, uh, my friend, Dr. Raman from Bangladesh. He is the leader of Beat Association from Uzbengal Uzb and Bangladesh to got their own association there. He is the, one of the important leaders and he is the ex-professor, head of the Department of Cardiology at National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. Raman, please. Shibra, please stay back. We we'll discuss at the end. I will share my slide. Okay.
Could you all please help him? Yeah. No, I cannot find my. Oh, have to go out that one. No, you have to take this out. I think so. I could not go in. It is in the desktop. Hello. So we can yes, see sir. your uh, screen. Just open your presentation. Yeah. We can see the desktop. Yeah. No, presentation is open. That's right. Because no. it is in a desktop. So, but you are still on the web browser. Can you? We can see the slideshow. We the can browser. see the. Yeah. yeah. Can you open the Sorry? presentation? Yeah, yeah. Please open the presentation. Sir, oh. your. Okay. We are viewing your desktop. Okay. This yes. is just PPT. Yes. 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 Sharing my slide. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, or I can go here. Final zero contrast PPT. Yes, this one. Okay. okay. It's fine. Yes, sir. Now go for. Okay. Slide show. Yeah. Okay. Go down, please. Go down. Uh, go down to the flash time. Okay. Flash here. Okay. Is yes. this okay? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pamza and uh, Dr. Prakash and Dr. Hazra for inviting me. Such kind of excellent meeting. It is really honor for me. So my topic is zero contrast PCI case business. So we can see that uh, the zero contrast and the plasty, the if we do the PCI in the CKD patient, you can see the cumulative percent of death is increasing definitely with the CKD and CNA patient, then non CAKD or no CNS patient in respect to the mortality is definitely. So we have to as we have to do the something for the uh, coronary disease in the CKD patient. So we have to take care of this patient. And this is the slide I have borrowed from uh, Jia Dali. You can see that the zero contrast angioplasty and the standard angioplasty. In zero contrast, contrast property is 0 0.7, standard 7, uh, 8, 58%. And renal uh, replacement therapy, 0% and 27%. So there is a marked improvement in the case of the zero contrast angioplasty than standard angioplasty. And stent thrombosis, both sides know, but repeat revascularization is significantly lower in the case of the uh, uh, zero contrast angioplasty. So definitely there is a some role for zero contrast angioplasty, and definitely you will agree with me that standard um, PCI is not an option especially in the setting of the advanced neural disease who are not on dialysis. And how it is done? Zero contrast PCI is performed one week after the ultra low contrast angi angiography, that is small volume of dye and taking one or three fixer is more than enough for uh, two coronary artery. And previous angiogram was used as guide and multiple guide were placed to create a metallic silhouette of the coronary anatomy as roadmap for the PCI. And PCI was performed with the intravascular guidance and fractional flow reserve was used to assess the significance of the lesion severity and confirm the physiological improvement. This is the method we are doing in the zero condition angioplasty. This is my first case. And this patient was, uh, was putting an stand in the LCX and the LCX was patent, but there is a borderline lesion just discharged to the diagonal. You can see that without injecting any dye, we are sticking one wire into the diagonal and the lesion was just here. And you must appreciate that we are going without any dye injection. And another is that one wire in the LED. Then, and this patient having a creatinine 3 and EGFR was 35 ml. So that is definitely significant CKD patients. And as the lesion was borderline, so this is the, um, uh, this is the FFR wire. And we have uh, give the adenosine, this is the resting 0.87, but after giving the LED 300 ml adenosine, there is significant drop that is 0.7, that is 0.7. That indicates that lesion is significant. So we decided to the uh, uh, stenting of the lesion by IVAS, zero-contrast angioplasty. Then we have done an IVAS 
species with diversity shows that a significant decline in the metric segment of the energy. Then we have putting a stand, and then we have done an FFR again. We can see that the before the adenosine and after the adenosine that indicate that the after putting an adenosine after putting and stenting the uh, the adenosine is improved and that. Uh, that indicate that lesion was really significant. And uh, we have done an IVAS, and IVAS shows that the state is nicely apt. And as it is an academic interest, so, so we have check, taken check and diagram, and this is the result. We have taken, so in this case, we have used only 3 ml of the dye. This is for recording. This is not necessary for, for future recording and for our uh, academic interest we have done this. And this is a second case of 50 years old man presented with ongoing chest pain. He has a history of recent NTDMI and this for hypertension CKD class 4, investigated GAGFR 20 ml, and he has a hypokinesia of the interior. That indicates there is a fibro tissue in the So this is the bridge and you picture that was, you can see that the LED tight lesion in the middle segment of the LED. And the ostium seems to be proximal segment, not very, very significant disease. And if we uh, see, and you'll appreciate that the lesion is mainly in the mid segment. So we have decided that by this angiogram that we can do the uh, zero contrast angioplasty by IBUS very easily. And there is no, uh, th there is no uh, sizable diagonal artery. So, this is the, we have done an IVAS, it is a free procedure, and we have put a wire under the fluoroscopy guidance with the angiographic uh, uh, control angiogram, and we have done an IVAS. We can see that the baseline study of the IVAS, that is, uh, it is uh, diseased, and let me, it is not a disease, and LED digital is also diseased, and also, and also that the IVAS before uh, we have an also significant IVAS, we have a significant burden and stenosis in the LED. Now the scenario is totally different. Initially, it was shows that the LED ostea is not significant. But on the IVAS, it shows a significant difference. So it is becoming a little bit challenging and a difficult case. So, and uh, we have taken the guide catheter of the seven. And thing is that we can uh, we can do the uh, cross our technique that is uh, putting the stent in the uh, left main and then and other thing is that it may not be good because this is uh, maybe we have to take angiogram and we have to read and um, uh, see the more complicated that's why we have to, we have to decide to put the uh, stent just at the level of the ostia but putting the stent at the end of the ostia is really challenging in this case IFAS gadgets may be a good option, but the, as the catheter is a seven, we have no uh, guide catheter eight, then, uh, then it may be difficult to put in the wire. So what we are thinking that we have taken one wire in the in the marginal, first marginal branch, and you can see that, and we have taken the darker portion of the wire, we pull back with the thought that the, if we take the darker portion of the wire across the LCX, then the wire will float and the, it will indicate that this is the ostium. And with control angiogram, we have taken control angiogram. This is for academic purpose. We have keep the uh, 2cc dye. Uh, and you can see that the that is, that is, it is nicely placed, the wire, and the, we can delineate the ostium by this technique. And this is the first time a, a marker wire technique was used uh, for this uh, LED ostium PCI. And um, uh, this is the, and uh, and by we have taken an one injection, very one to two cc dye, and you can see that this is the position. And after putting the stent, you can see that it's nicely placed. And this is a very uh, indicative that we are across the ostium of the LED and covering that. And this is the result. You can you appreciate that it's this stent is nicely deployed. And we have done IVAS that indicate that the the, the LED stent is positioned just at the ostium. And this is the final result. That final result is really good. And uh, this case was published in a journal, which indicates this is the first case where 
uh, where the uh, marker wire technique was used to put the acrochel in the ostium. Yes, uh, I am agree with you that you are putting the IVAS catheter here and you can see where is that uh, eastern place. And in that case, I think it's possible you need an atrial guide catheter and a little bit cumbersome. But uh, if you want to put it, if the and as the uh, left man was not significant disease on the LED ostium, that's why I decided to put a stent right. And the patient is follow up on six months and the patient is fine. Yes, please. A 60 years old lady presented with history of the exertional chest pain for six months and the patient was on a testing medication and a risk factor type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and KD class 3. And his creatinine was 3.5 and GFR, EGFR was 30. And control hypokinesia mid and apical segment of the anterior wall and distribution of 50%. You can see that there's a LED lesion and big diagonal. You can see that the diagonal and LED is same diameter, same diameter. And there is a significant lesion in the uh, uh, diagonal and it is more than five. It is more than five and severely deviated. And uh, the angle is not favorable. So we decided to do the Mm, uh, PCI, we decided to do the PCI or with two stand strategy, not a single stand strategy, because if we lost this diagonal, it may be difficult because we have to be finished this case by zero contrast or minimum contrast of the plastic. And then we have done an IVAS. IVAS shows that it lies. If you are plaque in the diagonal LED. And as the diagonal is equal to the LED, we decided for pull out stenting. And so we put we decided to the um, uh, one is here, but after putting the stent, there is a there is a plaque shifting from the uh, diagonal to the LED, and the patient complaining of severe chest pain. In that case, we have to take the chest angiogram. That's an indication to do the angiogram if the patient is being a severe chest pain, and we have a three ml of the dye to inject to see what is happening. So we are seeing that there are a lot of plaques in so it should not be a problem. Then we put one more stent, it, it, it is a, um, uh, it, it, it is a culotte stenting, it, it is a culotte stenting and now the, um, and we have done the pre-dilatation and the is implanted and now the, this is the stent implantation and this is the final result. We appreciate that is the final result is good. So what is the take home message ladies and gentlemen? Imaging and physiology guided PCA is a very safe and feasible technique that results in excellent regulation of the exterior. Appears to be offer an improvement in outcome over the current standard of practice. This, that this technique was allow access to the PCA of patients, such as those of the severe kidney disease who are not on renal replacement therapy that is dialyzed. Thank you. Thank you, Roman, for excellent presentation. Please stay back. We'll discuss at the end of the another forces group, uh, presenter. Next speaker, Dr. Diman Gaonli, sorry, Diman Kahali, is a dynamic intervention cardiology beam Miller Heart Research Center, and he also is the current chairman of NIC Council of Cardiology Society of India. Dr. Kahali, please. So Dr. Kali hasn't joined yet. I think we'll have to go on to the next speaker, Dr. Ranjan Sharma. That's fine. So next speaker, Dr. Ranjan Sharma. Is the Dr. Ranjan, unmute yourself here. Yeah. yeah. Organ security are of SCI. And he's the head of the professor of cardiology and head of the department of cardiology NRS Medical College. A few words uh, uh, for Dr. Sharma and because of Rajan Sharma, Dr. Panja and Dr. Dipishina, this SCI 2020 was a reality and a possibility and I hope everybody is enjoying and we are from the whole community of cardiologists of Calcutta are grateful to Dr. Sharma, Dr. Panja and Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma, please. Chairpersons and moderators and delegates. I'll be presenting a case of uh, a nightmare that I faced in my cath lab about six months back. The patient was uh, having multiple risk factors in the form of uh, smoker, diabetic, male patient, hypertensive. 
he got admitted with uh, non stmi so in ecg changes on the interior wall with a wall motion mmd on echocardiography with ejection fraction of 52 percent hemodynamically the patient was stable had a good saturation on room air the glycemic control was good renal function was good and we took the patient for coronary angiography and revascularization out of 48 hours though this was his right coronary artery it was uh, non-dominant small and normal the left you can see it's a very dominant vessel you have a very critical lesion calcified tortuous led there is a big gramus which again shows a moderate lesion in the proximal part long long segment and there is some osteal disease in the dominant circumflex so we started the procedure by pushing the wire run through intermediate into the LED and dilated the lesion with 1.5 into 10 millimeter and then with a 2.5 into 8 millimeter the whole length of the LED was uh, dilated from the distal part up to the ostium thereafter I deployed a 2.75 millimeter into 28 millimeter DS in the mid LED segment and the stent was uh, the balloon was well expanded I took out the balloon into the proximal part of the LED and prepared the proximal LED bed with dilatation of this uh, balloon at six atmosphere and the balloon was well expanded so i took a balloon i took a stent 3.5 into 19 millimeter ds placed from the ostium of the led into the mid led stent the stent was well opposed you can see it is extending right from the ostium into the mid led stent and the balloon was well expanded the problem started now once pulling out the balloon from the stent from the wire the wire came out along with the balloon now i had to post dilate the stent so i tried to push the wire again into the led the problem was the wire got stuck in the proximal struts of the led stent and pulling the wire the guide was coming in close contact with the stent and it was not coming out so what I did was I took a 1.5 into 10 millimeter small deflated balloon, took it to the tip of the PTC wire and tried to pull the stent, pull the wire. The wire was not coming out. And in the process, what happened, the LED stent was deformed. It was elongated and it got stressed into the LMCA. And apprehending trouble, I took a second guide. I disengaged the first guide. It contained the PTCA wire which is stuck. You can see the tip of the PTCA wire has come into the left main. And through the second guide, I introduced a wire into the LED and into the circumflex. And now I thought that uh, now I have secured the LMCA to LED and LCA circulation. I will try to pull out the wire again. <coughs> So initially what I did was I took a 1.5 into 10 millimeter balloon, tried to dilate the very proximal struts of the deformed stent, thinking that it will release the stuck wire. But it was not coming out despite my multiple attempts. So I took the wire, balloon again on that PTCA wire, the first wire that has been stuck. And you can see the balloon here and the balloon has been kept at the distal edge of the uh, distal tip of the PTC wire. And pulling the wire, the guide had come close to the LMC stent, to the LED stent, and the wire was not coming out. In the process of this uh, pulling and pushing again and again, the ribbon got unwrapped. You can see the tip of the wire, which has been stuck here, the unwrapped wire, wire is now into the first guide. I took out the guide and I tried to complete the procedure by dilating the deformed LED stand with a 3.3 into 8 millimeter NC balloon, dilating at a high pressures. 
Then I took a 4 into 24 millimeter DES extending from the ostium of the left main into the deformed portion of the LED stent. And it was deployed at a significant pressure of 12 atmosphere. Then I dilated the LED portion of the LMC stent with a 4 into 10, 8 millimeter NC balloon. And you can see the radio opaque portion of the wire that is now entrapped into the left main by the LMC stent. And the whole of the LED was, uh, stent was dilated with a 4 into 8 millimeter NC balloon. You can see the deformed stent here that has been uh, held by this LMC stent and the tip of the wire is visible here. Then the LMC portion of the LMC stent was dilated with 4.5 into 10 millimeter NC balloon. This was the final result. The LED is flowing well. The LMC has been, uh, the stent has been well expanded. And you can see the tip of the wire which has been stuck there and has been gelled. And the wire is now extending from LMC into the descending aorta up to the common iliac artery. So the whole thing was, patient was stable, but some things that we missed was the tip of the wire, I just could not make it come out because it was hanging into the descending thoracic aorta. I didn't make any further attempts. I could not do intracoronary imaging because of the complications that I rose. The surgical team was uh, sought. They came, but they opined that we should not do any other further intervention because the patient was now stable. And we opted for a long-term potent DAPT and close follow-up. So the, what the lessons I learned is uh, always keep the PTC wire wet and clean in between the device exchange. The glove should always be clean and wet with a clear heparinized solution that is kept in the operation table. One should have some extra seconds that you can spend while taking out the devices over the wire because this is the time the if the time the time taken for the procedure is long, the, there can be, can be a lot of friction between the balloon and the wire, and the wire can come out at this stage. So you should have some uh, radio guidance during the removal of the devices, and do not panic. Apply your past experiences, or you discuss with your other colleagues whatever they have faced, and then you learn from their mistakes and their uh, whatever they have done. And all these things are not written in the books. You have to learn from your experiences and your colleagues' experiences. And uh, I always tell that you keep your surgical team in good humor because they will come to your, come for your rescue once it is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sorma, for excellent presentation. We have discussed at the end. Next speaker, Dr. Aftar Khan. Dr. Aftar Khan is a dynamic interventional cardiologist at Apple Hospital, Calcutta. And he is a man of interventional cardiology for complex PCI. Uh, thank you, Dr. Panja, for your uh, kind words of introduction. And I'll thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to do, be here with you all. Uh, this is, a, I think, uh, not a very complex uh, case. I think this is something that we've all been doing since long. And uh, a double wire technique for it trifurcation vision and I think uh, two guides is better than one. So I just present my two cases. One, this was a gentleman who was 68 years old, a smoker, hypertensive, came in the, uh, as uh, they always do, most of the complex cases would come on a weekend and this gentleman came after a seven hours duration after he had taken all his antacids and he had taken a bottle of soda to get rid of his gas. Uh, he was in Calypse class two, ECG showing an anterior wall STEMI and the echo revealed a wall motion abnormality in the anterior wall with an ejection fraction I think what is happening now, he's asked me to, okay. Uh, so he, uh, there is an ejection fraction of 45%. Uh, the creatinine is normal, and this gentleman then consented for a primary uh, PCI. Uh, so these were the angiogram shoots, uh, and the left, uh, the right system was normal. Now again, uh, the thing is that here I went from the groin approach rather than the radial, because the gentleman had borderline hemodynamics, uh, and there was a concern whether I would need a balloon su support, and therefore uh, I prepared both groins for him. And uh, this was the fact that uh, because he had an anterior wall MI, uh, after you've taken a diagnostic right shoot, which is normal, 
we normally would go with a guide directly rather than taking a diagnostic uh, catheter uh, shoot. And uh, this is something for our uh, budding uh, uh, interventional cardiologists where you know when you have an anterior volume, you go with a guide directly. So this is a complex lesion that I see there. Uh, there is a prob an LED total thrombotic occlusion with a TME1 flow distally. And there is a uh, circumflex lesion at the ostium. And there's a large ramus which has a disease at the ostium. So this is a gentleman who's had an anterior wall MI now, and he's presented with this. And there's another view which shows this lesion uh, in the uh, ramus and the LED. Uh, the circumflex lesion is not well seen in this view. So what are the options we had? One was to shift for a CABG, and uh, the other was to do a primary PCI to only the culprit artery of the LED, uh, keeping a hemodynamic support. And then we stage the PCI to the ramus and the circumflex pre-discharge before he goes home. Or the other could be to a complete revascularization all in one setting, where you do a PCI to the LED and also tackle the ramus and the circumflex in one go. Uh, I think uh, suddenly, as Dr. Ranjan said, uh, well, we also keep our surgeons in good humor and uh, suddenly the surgeon becomes more relevant for me. But again, you have to realize that this is in the middle of the night where uh, delaying a C, we know that emergency CABG may lead to a segment delay and reperfusion. And from our uh, PCI data, we know that there's an 8% increase in the risk of, uh, in the relative risk of dying at one year for every 30 minutes delay from the onset of symptoms to primary angioplasty. So when you extrapolate the same data to CABG, we know that uh, you're not going to get a CABG within a period of an hour. And uh, it's probably going to take more than two hours for us to uh, get the things, uh, get the artery flowing again. You're already delayed by seven hours thanks to this gentleman coming late. Uh, so we then decided to go out for a PCI. I decided for a femoral approach, as I said, because uh, I thought one side, anyway, I'm going to prepare for an eye balloon, IBP and keep it ready. So uh, it didn't make sense for me to keep one other artery uh, from the radial. But again, you could do one artery and one uh, from the femoral and one take one for the radial. So it was a seven French access for me. And uh, the strategy was basically to just get through to the LED and uh, why protect my other branches. Uh, so then this is the 7 French uh, and I've wired my uh, LED and the ramus. Uh, I've done a thrombosuction here. Now we could again contemplate whether we really do a thrombosuction. I usually tend to not do thrombosuction for very proximal lesions because you always have a, run, a risk of uh, getting your thrombus back into the proximal arteries. Well, uh, this was a case, I don't know, and I just went ahead into the thrombosuction because uh, the LED was really very thrombotic there, uh, visible angiographic thrombus, and I managed to get a flow there. And uh, this was then, uh, the distal lesion was uh, stented with a, a short stent. And uh, then uh, this was the flow where you had TME3 flow uh, going into the LED. Now the other issue was now fixing up the other, uh, the proximal part of the LED. And you see that the ramus uh, still has this tight uh, lesion there. And you can start seeing that with the artery, with the wiring of the ramus, uh, the flow in the ramus also started to, to, flow, to slow down. And uh, in this view, it has completely stopped. So I did a small balloon dilatation, making sure that we try to avoid a very aggressive dilatation of the ramus ostium. But even though I took a very small balloon at 215, we still see that you have ended up with a dissection flap in the ostium of the ramus. So we are now then committed to stenting. But before stenting, I said, because the flow in the ramus has now improved, I could just do a balloon dilatation and then see. So what I did is basically stented across the left main to the ostium across the, the LED because my intention was to keep my LED flowing first. And that is the most important thing. The MI, the artery, uh, the culprit has to, has to be uh, maintained well. And then I looked at it again, and I still see that dissection flap in the proximal part of the uh, a large ramus with a disease at the ostium of the circumflex too. Well, I tried doing a, a little prolonged balloon dilatation, hoping that that would pack back my, my, my uh, dissection flap. But again, they did not seem to be look, working too well. And the dissection flap still was persisting there. So I then was committed to a uh, sort of stenting. And this, what I tried is to take a double blind. So what I did is I already had an access on the other side. So I take another EBO guide. And one with the first guide, which is already uh, sort of into the LED and the ramus, the second guide now goes into the circumflex. And I did a balloon dilatation or a kissing balloon into the ramus and the circumflex, trying again to look at the ramus. Uh, my intention was to avoid a stent as far as possible. Uh, but again, as I said, this poster thing, you still see the dissection flap there in the proximal uh, part of the uh, ramus. And then eventually, I, I decided to put a stent there. And uh, in all the views, you can still see the LED looking good, uh, but the ramus are not looking too good. Uh, a stent was taken into the ramus, and uh, balloons were kept in the LED and the, and the uh, circumflex. And uh, this is the stent that is being positioned. And uh, finally, did a triple kiss after it's stenting the LED. After start putting a stent in the circumflex, I did a triple kiss with uh, two additional uh, balloons in the LED and in the uh, in the uh, ramus uh, and in the circumflex rather. And this was the final result uh, post uh, triple kiss. Uh, 
and this is the other view uh, showing a well deconstructed uh, carina uh, took out the other wires and then finally did a proximal port uh, to reconstruct the the left main so this was the final result that I left this gentleman with and we could get away without a balloon pump and he made a, a good recovery uh, in the post uh, procedural period uh, and these were the other shoots which showed that the circumflex ostium did not show too much of a lesion and in a thrombotic milieu I did not want to put too many stents into the into the left knee in there and the LED the culprit artery was uh, flowing pretty decently uh, end of the procedure because it is a complex case it did an iverse run and this showed that the stents overlap segment was good and the stent in the left main uh, sorry was also well opposed yeah and this was another run into the ramus also not the second this is the ramus and it showed that the stent was again well opposed there uh, yeah so this uh, gentleman had a follow up and he's, it's been almost almost three and a half to four years that he's been on a follow up he's been on dual antiplatelet still and high intensity statins a check angio was done at one year post procedure and uh, this was a one year follow up and it still showed that the stents were doing pretty well uh, and this is the led uh, and this is where the the carina still looked good with no segment stenosis in either of these branches the second case was an elderly gentleman again hypertensive copd crescendo angina despite optical medical therapy a normal lv systolic function mildly depressed renal function this gentleman was very clear that uh, the fact that he had severe uh, angina which was crippling his uh, active lifestyle but he was very clear in his mind that he was absolutely averse to any open surgical procedure so this was the the, the uh, sort of the um, bet that he had before he got his with his uh, son before he decided for any uh, invasive strategy so this was again an angio that we did and here you can see again there's a disease in the uh, proximal part of the uh, led there is a segment disease in the ramus here and there's a large uh, circumflex which is also occluded uh, extending into the om there and uh, the led is totally occluded so what we are seeing there is actually a large diagonal and the led in fact is totally occluded in the mid part after the the diagonal and uh, the other view also shows the same the same thing this rc also had disease so the first thing we did was to tackle the rc and put two stents there and uh, this was the rc post stenting and then uh, with the contralateral approach uh, 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 revascularized the LED. It was a uh, CTO did not show too much there, uh, but again with the balloon support and wire escalation, managed to get the wire into the uh, distal part of the LED. Did a balloon dilatation, stented the proximal part of the LED, and uh, finally recrossed into the yeah, so stented into the LED. Then recrossed into the diagonal and did a, a provisional tap technique. Used a two stent strategy there. Uh, and this was the LED lesion. So there was a, I had landed in fact on the plaque there. And so when I pulled out the wire, I realized that there's a muscle a myocardial bridge there. And this looks very bad because the outflow is not too good. This stent is likely to close again in the future because uh, we have landed on an area of, of, of a plaque there. So then put another stent there in the mid part of the LED too. And then this looked uh, pretty good. Recrossed into the diagonal and did a, oh, my video is not playing now. Okay. Recrossed into the diagonal and then did a kissing balloon. Uh, okay, I think we just move ahead. So then mm -hmm. I the circumflex also. And uh, this was again, we used another guide to get into the, the circumflex and the uh, ramus to viaprotect both. So this you can see again, there are two stents here. And this is the third stent which I've placed into the left, into the proximal part of the LED. Uh, this was sequentially done. So this was first the, uh, the LED and the circumflex were dilated. Uh, sorry, the circumflex and the ramus were first dilated and then the LED and the circumflex were dilated. Uh, making sure that you keep a balloon still in the uh, in the, uh, the videos. Unfortunately, I'm not able to play them. But anyway, you can see that there is there are three stents there which are forming the trifurcation there. Oh, one of them is playing. Oh, I, I don't know. So anyway, you can see that there are three stents there, and this is how the reconstruction of the carina was done. So trifurcation lesion, I think uh, we don't have any good way of doing it. There have been studies which have looked at, again, this triple kissing balloon with, with, with uh, uh, using a single stent or using a multiple stents. We know that lesser is always better. But in the left main, we need to understand that circumflex is not a, a simple side branch. Circumflex is a major side branch. And uh, though we know that the circumflex uh, ostium is the one that really causes most of the results or the adverse results that we see in patients with uh, trifurcation lesions, our intention is usually to not uh, tackle the circumflex with uh, too much aggressive procedures and keep it to the minimal possible. Uh, certain techniques have been described, uh, which include uh, doing sequential uh, dilatation rather than doing uh, triple kissing. 
and the Kurdistan technique. Uh, this is a small report uh, from, from those 40 to 50 cases that was published, uh, which looked at again doing it sequentially rather than doing it uh, in a uh, in a uh, triple uh, kissing fashion. Now the trifurcation lesions are unique in the sense that you need a bigger guide. So you need an eight French guide. If you're using a one guide, you need to use an eight French guide to achieve a final triple kiss comfortably. When I say comfortably, you could probably do it with a seven two. But then again, there's a lot of wire entrapment and you tend to have a lot of uh, gritty feel and you have uh, problems when you're doing a seven French uh, triple kiss. And therefore, uh, this is something, an eight French is something that is usually what is recommended. The problem is eight French we've not been using for so long and uh, the, the, the catheter, you really, the, the shelf life expires and you have to make sure that your, your technician always has an available one on the, on the shelf. So the availability of eight French on the guide uh, on the shelf is usually an issue in most labs. The other issue is radial uh, access. Now, when you are using a radial access with our Indian patients, we usually are limited by a seven French and uh, eight French becomes a bit too bulky for our Indian radial arteries. Uh, uh, Dr. GL Sharma is here and we could have his expertise also. And I think brachial also has its problem. When you go with a brachial in an eight French, you end up having pseudoaneurysms and you have uh, hematomas there. Uh, elderly with torches femoral anatomy also have a problem. So you, what you could do is that in a trifurcation, you could use one radial and one uh, femoral, or you could use both radials. You could do the right and the left radial uh, simultaneously. As I said, in a single guide, volume entrapment and wire entrapment becomes an issue. And the second important thing is that sometimes a bailout strategy myth procedure. For example, when I started off with a seven French guide in the, in the primary plasty, suddenly you realize that you need more stents. A bailout strategy, or if you started with the six French, then again, it becomes difficult to use a, a change of catheter mid guide, uh, midway of a procedure. And therefore, a, a, a double technique or double guide usually is usual, useful in these procedures. One has to be careful that don't intubate both these guides into the left main or into the parent artery simultaneously. So one has to keep one of them intubated and the other one has to be floating. But again, as I said, one has to know this procedure because a double guide is a standard procedure in case of coronary ruptures or perforation, where with one guide, you'd be sealing off your uh, ruptured uh, coronary artery with a dilated balloon proximally, and you take another puncture to get your other guide down there. So it's a, a standard procedure when you're doing your uh, complex work. And as Dr. Sharma just showed his case also, where a double guide usually is what, what you do, where you still maintain your flow into the, uh, or you don't lose your wire access from your main uh, artery and get another guide down to do your uh, remaining procedures. Again, one need to understand that not all trifurcation lesions are the same. So one should not try doing something heroic uh, just for the sake of uh, doing it. So cowboy approach is not something that we all uh, agree to or something that we uh, recommend. I think we all need to understand that there's a clinical risk assessment. There's an angiographic pattern that one needs to look at. Side branch access, looking at the size, the discrepancy of side branch, morphology of lesion, calcivation, tortuosity, all these would make a difference in terms of what approach is done. And it's not just a trifurcation where you go and put in a guide and put in stents and balloons. I think there is a different uh, approach that is needed and individualization of approach is needed in each case. Uh, important tips that I'll leave with you with is that you need a seven or an eight French. As, as I said, you may use two guides if needed. Why are all the branches? See, it's important to protect branches. By opening one branch, you close another branch, you've lost a lot of your myocardium. Lesion preparation is the, is the key. So it's important that don't take in devices unless you've prepared your lesion well. Adequate pre-dilatation, uh, rotablation, Imaging is always a fun help. Uh, it always gives you an idea about whether you've been successful in adequately deploying your stents. Uh, your chances of V stenosis is always based upon uh, minimal luminal diameters, which are lesser, especially in the left main. And if, uh, unless you get a good under, uh, under expanded stents, are going to produce problems for you. Be necessary. I mean, it's an IBP is, is always helpful, but it's not necessary. You could always keep it as a standby, unless you're doing an RCA with a, or a poor LV in a function. Well, stents, I think we keep it to the minimal if possible, and we know this from all our data, uh, whether it's in the left main or everywhere else. Single stent, double stent, triple stent, less to the better is uh, is what is the is the key. And again, as I said, uh, make sure that you're pre-dilating the stent struts prior to taking your balloons or your stents uh, struts, uh, taking the next stents to the struts. And again, we have to use our double standard, uh, your, your two stent techniques that are done. We can always use it for our trifurcation lesions also. We may need to do some inhibitory techniques and liberal uh, end up always with a kissing balloon. Uh, you could do a sequential. Uh, final tripping, uh, triple kissing is something that is always uh, beneficial. So uh, you could do either a sequential balloon dilatation or you could do a final triple kiss. Uh, so uh, this is what my presentation. And thank you for your uh, patient hearing. Triple kisses, Dr. Khan. I think the next presenter is Dr. Madhumati Panja. And we'll ha we will have discussion in the, you know, after the, all the presentations are over. Dr. Madhubanti, you can share your screen.
Dr. Madhavanti, are you there? Yes, he is in online. Madhavanti, unmute yourself. Dr. Rajanag is there. You could proceed to Rajanag if she is not around. Yeah, I think we can uh, proceed with Dr. Rajanag and then Dr. Madhavanti as well. Raja, you can uh, start sharing the screen. Oh, Madhavanti, are you there? Yes, yes, I've joined. So, Dr. Mandal was supposed to run. That's why. Oh, it's okay then. Okay, Madhavanti, uh, finish and then I'll be waiting. Yeah, yeah, yes. Unless she presents, Dr. Panja cannot rejoin because the same laptop is being used. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to present uh, endovascular treatment of CT and Takasa arthritis. Uh, this is a short history. She's a 38 years old female patient, a doctor by profession from Raipur. Known history of hypertension since last 10 years. She was refractory to medical therapy. She was diagnosed as type 3 Takayosa arthritis. Her P and C and CNK was positive since five years. She had high CRP and high ESR since five years. On examination, we got clinical brewing on carotid, intra and infrascapular region, and an abdomen. Patient was immediately started on steroid and methotrexate with antihypertensive drugs. So her creatinine was 120 milligram per deciliters. Creatinine, uh, urea was 120, creatinine was 6.8, hemoglobin was 6.8. So dialysis was planned in Raipur, but patient refused and got admitted in Kolkata. So what was the treatment plan? Our treatment plan was after correction of anemia, we started hydration. The hydration was started for 24 hours prior to the procedure and continued 72 hours after the procedure. Prior to the procedure, we loaded the patient with aspirin 325 mg and ticagrelor 90 mg, two tablets, stat dose. So this is the renal angiogram of the patient. Left renal and left renal artery showing 95% stenosis and right renal artery showing CTO, chronic total occlusion. So we started with the left renal artery. BMW coronary wire was used to cross the lesion. A 4 into 15 semi-compliant coronary NC balloon was inflated at 14 atmospheric pressure. After that, sequential balloon dilatation was done. A 4 into 26 DES onyx was positioned and inflated at 18 atmospheric pressure. So the, the lesion was post-dilated with 4 into 18 non-compliant balloon with proper opposition as we all can see. So this is the acceptable result of the left renal artery. Now we proceeded with the right renal artery chronic total occlusion. This right renal artery was crossed with Sion blue wire with great difficulty. A 4 into 16 semi-compliant balloon was positioned and inflated. After that, sequential balloon dilatation was done with NC balloon. A 4 into 18 DES onyx was deployed at 18 atmospheric pressure. The lesion was post dilated with 4 into 15 non compliant balloon. So this is the final result after opening the CT of right renal artery. So what was the treatment on discharge? Uh, we started with steroid 60 mg, which was gradually tapered for six months. Methotrexate 15 mg OD, aspirin 75 mg OD, ticagrelor 90 mg BD, and amlodipine 5 mg. Result on follow-up after six weeks, the BP dropped down to 120 AT from 220 to 110. Hemoglobin increased to 10.5 and creatinine dropped down to 
the patient being a doctor resumed her normal duties so what is the take home message from our case in this kind of patients there is enough scope of intervention in spite of ckd with ct of renal artery but meticulous decision making is extremely important for long term benefit steroid methotrexate dapt were continued for preventing recurrence and restenosis the patient is still doing well and at present she is on aspirin methotrexate and amlodipine 500 thank you everyone great presentation and good case uh, dr madhavanti so my apologies to dr saroj mandal as well as dr rajanath so uh, i missed out dr saroj mandal's name so next i'm leaving dr. then yeah. next is dr saroj mandal and then dr uh, rajanath Thank you, uh, Professor Panja, for uh, inviting me to uh, discuss about the topic of PCI in COVID patients or PCI in COVID time. Uh, you all know that uh, in India we are in the form of peak of the COVID situations, and uh, you know also know that this uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically altered the delivery of the refurbishment therapy. For patients with ST deficient myocardial infarction, so in this crucial time, it is, seems prudent to re-evaluate the STEMI refurbishment pathways. You also know that STEMI rate have declined during this COVID-19 pandemic. It perhaps partly because of patients are unwilling to access the emergency medical system, or they don't want to risk them to a hospital exposure of COVID-19. Patients who are presenting to hospitals without PCI capability are subject to transfer delays for primary PCI even after transfusion refusal, and because the COVID-19 demands, those presenting by ambulance directly to the PCI-related hospitals not receiving the benefit of pre-hospital catheterization because of it has been suspended. In emergency department. Also, evaluation are prolonged with additional screening for COVID-19. Transfer from the emergency department to the cath lab is complicated by additional exposure and delays in the preparation associated with personal protective equipment. As the frequency and duration of PCI-related delays for refurbishment therapy, fibrinolytic therapy, and pharmacoinvasive strategy offer a logical. Simply, safe, and effective alternative for an overtaxed healthcare system, while decreasing the COVID-19 exposure risk to healthcare providers. Now, I am going to present few patients who are COVID positive. I have done PCI, and in some patients where I attended the emergency with personal protective equipment during the PCI. The first patient, Mr. Sundeep, is a 63 years old male, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, but smoker, presented delayed with the inferior oral MI and complete heart block. Directly with the patient to the cath lab without knowing the COVID result. Then with the personal protective equipment, we started the procedure, and you can see that we had done temporary pacemaker, and you can see appreciate that there is. Left coronary system normal and right coronary system. There, there is retrograde flow from the left coronary system. On right coronary injection, you will appreciate that there is flush cut off from the mid part of the right coronary artery, the huge caliber artery, and also there is huge thrombus body. We cross that right coronary mid part lesion with that standard work guide wire. And they tried to uh, that to and fro. That means that balloon negotiation through the lesion. After doctoring, just we had uh, realized that there is a huge burden of thrombus, and uh, it, we are not getting uh, even after my dilatation of that uh, that right coronary uh, mid part uh, that uh, total cut off area. They were not getting that that uh, flow adequate flow. And also in this point of time, I was not able to negotiate the distal part of that uh, lesion 
I thought maybe that I am in the some in Dimal area, particular digital part. So I tried to negotiate another wire, but within another wire, you are also facing the same problem. That means there will be the second lesson in the probably digital part of that artery, and it will never repeat a serial dilatation with that uh, uh, 1.5 or 2 into 10 millimeter balloon. We are not achieving the adequate result. After lots of try, at this point of time, patient was having repeated PT, VF, and he needed that, cardi that uh, cardio version, DC cardio version. And you can see that the heart was about to stop. Then we decided, uh, it was a late hour, I was at this patient came when I was about to finish my procedure in the uh, late night. So I decided that let us keep him on that GP2 inhibitor and observe for 24 hours. Then we'll decide for that course. Patient was having that ongoing chest pain and it was too late. We had used too much of dye. So we postponed this procedure and put him on GP2 inhibitor. And the next morning, the, his COVID result came and it was positive. So I am in a dual mind whether I will proceed further or I will keep him this uh, with positive management. I will ask him to come on the uh, after some time on that once he uh, become COVID negative. But later on after much discussion, I decided as we have started the procedure, we should again do the procedure. So on the third day again we started the procedure. You can appreciate that there is the same cut off with adequate dose of GPT which inhibitor for 24 hours, due dose, there is an improvement of the thrombus body. I negotiated the lesion again for big guidewire. Again, I started aggressive dilation. And you can appreciate that, and appreciate that there are some amount of flow. And at this point, I started PDCN stenting. At the digital part, I used 2.75 into 32 millimeter stent, Jodar Lemus using dark during stent. And next, I used 10 to 28 millimeter stent. And the last part, it was 4 into 22 millimeter stent. And these are the end result. I was happy there was TMC flow. And at this throughout the entire course, patient was having chest pain. That means the IRT was viable. So it was a good decision to proceed further on the third, even the third day. And I had, before doing this procedure, I had done the, given the injection in the left coronary system and there was retrograde flow. That means that this coronary, right coronary artery, uh, the, the supply in the viable myocardium. This is my second case. It was also COVID positive. This case came from the some other state, neighboring state uh, of that our where I am staying, West Bengal. And uh, after admission only, I came to know that he is COVID positive. So I was a dual mind whether I should uh, repeatedly expose expose myself to COVID or not. But this patient was one of the relative or the one of the staff of our hospital. So on this round, hematoma round and staff, all these issues, I, 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 I thought that it was try again on this patient for primary PCI. You can appreciate the critical lesion, long lesion of the LED. Just I'm going uh, to, uh, to uh, show you the end result. I used a two stent at the mid to discharge part, 3 into 32 millimeter Deuterium's uh, reviewing stent, and in the proximal part, again that uh, 3.5 into 30 millimeter stent, and deployed properly. I had done the post dilation adequately, and you can appreciate that is a good TMC flow, along with the weight expansion and opposition of the stents. This is a third case. Mr. Shifra goes again. This patient was COVID positive. He has ACS, high risk diabetes hypertensive and you see you can appreciate the severe trivial vessel disease she's 71 years she was having ongoing chest pain so i decided again with the pp kit personal equipment 
uh, with my staff, I started the procedure. Again, I will show you the end result. This is the end result. In the LED, I compared to use two stand because the lesson length was very big and LCX one stand and right polarity one stand. And he is now 65 years old, Mr. Arul Nondi. He had again the acute coronary syndrome, but we didn't get his COVID result. As the patient was ongoing chest pain, he was a very high risk case, unstable. His, uh, with, even with adequate anti risky medication, he was having continuous pain. So I decided to use the personal protein human again. I decided to go ahead in this case because you can appreciate there are late mainstream critical disease, LED proximal disease, right coronary system was normal, and the LCX osteum was free from any uh, uh, plug. We negotiated the lesion, and again we use two stain, distal part mid to digital part 3.5 mm stain and proximal part 4 into 32 mm stain. Both was totally mass drug eluding stain. We, we, we did aggressive direction of, of the balloon and this was the end result. You can appreciate there's good expansion, timid C flow and there was no compromise of that L6 ostia. The third case with the Shishir Bacho, again this patient was ACS. I am going to show you the high risk ACS patient. I, I, I can I can uh, I can express that during the last six, seven months, I have done more than 100 angioplasty. And out of this, I, I, I did in the emergency situation, the critical block. This patient is having that uh, AMC distal critical lesion, LED osteum critical lesion. I have not taken the map. I have not shown that much view, only one view I have shown. And uh, I have done that uh, tap technique, LMC, LMC, uh, I had this the tap technique. Uh, this is the end result. This is again the high risk ACS that uh, Mr. Nitai Chandra Das, you can see that he's 92 years old, probably he's more than 95 years old man, and severe tuberculosis disease, highly calcified, critical lesion. Again, I was compelled to address this patient with the personal protective equipment. And this was the end result. This is one young man presented with that acute coronary syndrome. The COVID result was averaging. He has LB dysfunction. Considering the quite young patient, I subjected the patient to coronary angiography. And this is the this is, you can appreciate the critical LMC lesion, distal part of the LMC almost hanging. So with all COVID protection. I address this patient and this is the end result. Single strength strategy, this is the end result. And he is also a young patient. He is a jogger, daily jogger. He used to jog, uh, used to do, do jogging in that uh, local park. Uh, he was quite asymptomatic. He is a non smoker, non diabetic, hypertensive. So when this patient presented with acute coronary syndrome, I was really surprised. Drop T was negative, ECG was not significant change. He had only the uh, minimum amount of chest pain, chest heaviness. So I thought this patient has the do uh, loss of exercise and was asymptomatic even the before of the day, day of admission. I thought it might be that uh, atypical chest pain. Initially, I subjected the patient to the CT coronary angiography because. Uh, this patient was COVID positive on the day of admission COVID result came and COVID result was positive. 
So I had done so much of COVID patient. I scared to do uh, do this uh, patient's uh, uh, intervention procedure. But the CT angio showed the mid part of LED subtural occlusion. So I compelled to begin this patient to undergo coronary angiography. Though the patient was COVID positive, I took the all protein measure, and you can appreciate there are subtral occluded that mid part of the LED. And as usual, this is the end result after post addition with that balloon. So without not going to much detail of the cases, now uh, regarding the COVID patients, we know that symptoms of chest pain or tiredness is common in COVID-19 patients. It is poorly localized and may be related to the underlying pneumonia. It may be associated with breathlessness and also associated with hypoxemia together with tachycardia may result in chest pain and electrocardiographic changes. Now, regarding ECD change, so far no specific ECD changes have been described in patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we can assume that minimal level of micro injury associated with the infection do not translate into characteristic ECD changes in majority of the patient. So same ECD change criteria for cardiac condition apply in patients affected by SARS-CoV-2 infection than in the general population. Regarding the biomarker, uh, we can see the, that, that uh, assume or see that some amount of cardiac troponin TLI concentration may raise along with that at, uh, 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 ATR natriuretic peptide, anti pro BNP, that related to that uh, myocardial stress or myocardial injury. But in absence of typical angina, chest pain, or EC changes, patient with mild elevation that is less than two third of that two to three times to the upper limit of normal does not require any workout. Now regarding treatment of that uh, COVID-19 with the NHGMI, testing for is extremely essential and patients also go to infect or go to results the patients into into four risk group one is very high risk group who are hemodynamically unstable or with cardiogenic shock recurrent and ongoing chest pain life threatening or unstable cardiac arrhythmia cardiac arrest or acute heart failure or mechanical complications they should undergo immediate invasive strategy like STEMI. high risk patient with established diagnosis of NHTMI based on cardiac troponin and dynamic HTD changes or recurrent syndrome, they should also undergo that uh, early invasive, early invasive uh, treatment that is less than 24 hours after before the, expo, uh, the, the uh, attending the department. And we need this patient to have SARS CoV 2. You don't get the SARS CoV 2 result, we should consider that they are SARS CoV 2 positive. And in the middle low risk patient, we should do the conjugate management. Regarding management of the uh, HTMI, COVID 19 uh, pandemic should not compromise the timely reperfusion therapy of the STEMI patient. In the line of current guidelines, reperfusion therapy remains indicated in patients with symptoms of ischemia of less than 12 hour duration and persistent ST elevation in at least two of the contiguous lead. Now, primary PCA remains the reperfusion therapy of choice if feasible within the time frame, usual time frame of 120 minutes and performed in facilities approved for the treatment of COVID-19 patient in a safe manner for healthcare providers and other patients. And primary PCA pathways may be delayed during this pandemic by additional 60 minutes according to multiple experiences and this delay is due to delay in the delivery of the care and the implementation of protective measures and if the target time cannot be made criminalisis and criminalisis is not contraindicated criminalisis should be become the first line of therapy if the sars cov results are not immediately available in STEMI patients any STEMI patient should be considered potentially infected. Now, during the procedure, we have to consider immediate complete revascularization if indicated. 
and appropriate in order to avoid staged procedure and reduce hospital stay. Now, in presence of persistent symptomatic evidence of ischemia, subobtrusive stenosis, and or angiographic unstable non calculations PCI during the same hospitalization should be considered. Treatment of other lesions should be delayed. Planning a new hospitalization after the peak outbreak. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Fanja, for uh, inviting me. Dr. Speaker, Dr. Raja, Dr. Raja Nath. Thank you, sir. Senior Intermediate Cardiologist. I'll start sharing my screen. Apple Hospital, Calcutta. Dr. Raja, please. Someone else is sharing.